these were terraces, so they'd cut into the sides of the mountains so they can have all their paddy fields. One day we got to walk through them, and that was very special for me. So this is a close-up of the rice. So this is a project, uh, it's not really an art project, but it kind of was in a way. Um, I've done this for several years um, in my yard. So morning glories are this very in invasive vine in a way, um, and they'll just grow up anything. So I started creating these walls. <laughs> um, like this is a wall between my house and my studio. So that's about nine or 10 feet. Um, by the end of the summer, it was way over that top green line. Um, so I would create these strings and then they would just sort of grow and I, could, I was almost creating sculpture in a way and I would rewind them um, to fill in holes and I would spend a good part of my day out there working <laughs> on this project. <laughs> Here's another one. They were all around the house that year. Unfortunately this past year I didn't do any. So. In addition to the vines and the plants, um, well, seeds, and this is a sunflower head. I'm always fascinated by these things and the details. And this is something that you'll see pretty frequently in my work, this sort of shape um, that's repeated over and over. I started also looking at cells. Um, specifically cancer cells. And I was interested, or I am in, interested in these for numerous reasons. One of them is their ability to grow, metastasize, um, which reminds me again of how um, the plants have sort of become invasive and take over. I'm also interested in the fact that these cells, to me or to the average person, are beautiful. Um, but yet, if we're an, an oncologist or a scientist, um, we'll see them and think of death or disease. So there's a sort of deceptive quality that I'm very fascinated by. Like this is prostate cancer. The one before was ovarian cancer. Um, I also, this work that, now I'm talking about the work that's in the gallery. Um, it was also inspired by whenever I was teaching up in Manitoba. Um, when I got there, they were getting ready to organize this large exhibit of work from 1950s printers, um, printmakers that were in the program at that point in time. And um, I started looking through some of the prints and I was amazed by this crazy depth that they had in their etchings. Um, I've never seen etchings like that before. They were really deeply etched. Um, so I started really getting interested in that idea and wondering how they were doing that. So I started looking at different um, artists and talking to some of the, the people that were still around um, about how they were doing that. And they were, of course at that point in time, they weren't concerned at all about toxicity. So pretty much they were using straight nitric acid to just sort of burn through the plate. Um, and luckily I had a pretty um, high tech, well, I don't know, good ventilation sort of print shop. Um, so I actually started um, playing around with the straight nitric acid myself um, and just started burning through plates, metal plates within uh, like five minutes <laughs> and I was like whoa. Um, it was pretty amazing. So I started creating these shaped plates um, in the shape of these cells. So this would have been one of the first ones. So each time you see um, a form, laser, ha -ha. like this, this is a different plate from this. So all of these are different pieces of copper, okay, that are printed. Um, so I started collecting these, creating these images and collecting them. Um, to date, I probably have 150. Once I moved here, I had to stop using the straight nitric acid. So now it takes me several days to go through a plate, but. <laughs> okay, so these are definitely um, continuing the same sort of um, invasive, taking over space, um, the interest in, interest in nature, um, the seed pods, the cancer, all of these things are 
being drawn upon for these images. And pretty much what I'm doing is taking those out of their original context and putting in, them into my own abstract language and creating these compositions. This one isn't quite as yellow. So again, every time you see a different little shape, that's a different plate. So for example, this piece here might have taken me, well, a very long time, but um, it probably went through the press um, 200 times. The way these images are created, it's a, very, it's a pretty formal process. Um, I'll print some, some of the different forms and then I'll hang them up and look at them. And they kind of go through cycles. So I'll look at them for a while and decide what they need and then go back to the press, print some more. Um, so it's a very back and forth and a very intuitive process. I often draw on top of them. Like this one includes a lot of colored pencil and um, Prismacolor marker as well. There's a detail of that one. Just to show you a little bit of the OCD action going on. <laughs> Um, these are also sort of exploring different technical things too, like this one. Um, I started exploring this technique that um, I learned in graduate school but hardly ever used um, called wood lithography that's um, basically only taught in Japan. And that's the background. I started exploring incorporating digital um, technology as well. Um, and the majority of the just sort of tr traditional two-dimensional pieces that are in the gallery have as a background um, a digital print. So like for example, this particular one here, that greenish brownish color in the background, the lighter color, I always forget about the laser. So this kind of color you see here, um, that was all printed on a large format printer. Um, of some cancer cells. And then on top of that, I'm layering all of my little shapes. And then lastly, this piece um, that's in the gallery now, this large piece that's in the gallery now. Um, so this piece was, it's taken about a year to finish it. Um, it's very time consuming, obviously. <laughs> it includes a lot of both etching and digital prints. Um, and I print them on paper and then they're glued to wood and then they're cut out with a scroll saw. Um, I had a student working for me, Sophie Brenneman, who deserves um, big recognition for this piece because she did um, probably two thirds of the cutting of all those obsessive shapes um, that you see in the gallery. Um, I was very blown away by her ability to uh, work that scroll saw. <laughs> um, so this piece, again, is that sort of expansion, growth, takeover. Um, if I had more, it would have taken over more space. Um, but I want it to sort of feel kind of claustrophobic, and it's kind of taken over your space. Let's see, I think I might have one more, but it's kind of silly when you can actually look at it in the gallery. <laughs> So I'd like to conclude by telling you that I find interest in the paradox and the dualities of our lives. Um, I'm compelled by nature and biology. Like many other feminist artists, I enjoy highly repetitive and labor-intensive activities, if you didn't already figure that one out. <laughs> um, and my work addresses the ideal of expansion and growth. Um, are there any questions? Yes? Where do you draw your inspiration for your colors? That's a good question. Um, it's interesting. A lot of the stuff that I do as I'm actually working is very intuitive. Um, I think a lot of my color schemes are pretty mute and neutral. And I think a lot of them come from the New Mexico landscape. Um, this one, I kind of got a little brighter on some of them. And um, so it was just sort of a color that felt right for me, if that makes any sense. I'm not a big fan of really bright colors. They make me feel uncomfortable. So it could also be part of that psychologically what colors I just feel best with. 
we lived in a bunch of different areas. So was, was uh, did you know the color difference when when, when you moved from place to place? Well, I think that's a really good question. Um, I never really was too into this, the color in Illinois where I grew up. Um, but in the desert, I love the color. The, and most people find the color really ugly and boring and brown. <laughs> but um, what I found living there was that the amount of subtlety and the shades were just intense. Um, so I think that was probably the most inspirational. Um, when I lived in Winnipeg, it was uh, you know winter time, six months out of the year. Negative 47 was the coldest temperature I saw. It was white, <laughs> so there wasn't really a whole lot. But in between there, there was a little bit of sort of this brown color. But it really wasn't very inspirational to me. Um, and here, I haven't unfortunately spent as much time in nature as I'd like to, so I haven't really saw it creep in as much. Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, so no, I don't usually have a plan. Um, I often think about ideas, but they're separate from actually working. I think about those and do that sort of thought in my head, but not usually when I'm making. When I'm making, it's more intuitive. And I try not to think. I try to just sort of do and respond. Then I will step away and look, and then I'll think. So it's kind of a back and forth. I find if I think too much in the actual act, um, that it becomes really boring, and the work become, the work becomes sort of stale. Um, as far as how do I know when enough is enough? Question that I've been asked a lot. I don't always know. <laughs> um, like stuff like these installations, and there's been a lot of other installations that I've created as well that I didn't show you. Um, it usually becomes like a practicality of time. Um, like for this one, time ran out, so I had to go with what I had. Um, but I see this as still growing. Um, I could see it with a million. <laughs> I feel weird even saying that, but maybe a million pieces. So will you recreate this installation? What, what will you do? You know, will you try to get it? Will it be the same? Or just, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have a, three more solo shows scheduled for this year of work related to this, so most likely there's going to be something um, with this installation and it might transform depending on the space. Um, it might grow depending on if I have time for it to grow any larger. A nice thing about working this sort of modulistic way is that it can kind of become a different piece every time. I would like to have had it expand a lot more onto the floor and the ceiling, um, but with that the particular gallery here it was kind of hard to do. And I also ran out of pieces. I don't know, but I'm thinking there's probably around a thousand, but I was going to count it when I take it down. Um, you mentioned an artist that was inspirational to you in the very beginning, and I just missed the name. The one with the cut and globes. Oh, her name is Shona McDonald. Say again? Shona McDonald. Thank you. I can give you her website later. Apparently, mm -hmm. um, what does the act of print making mean to you? Um, I think that's also a really good question. Um, the act of printmaking, I see it very much about being able to create multiples. Um, and I use these things kind of as a stamp, especially these circular etchings that I've created. Um, and I kind of see myself as I'm printing in this sort of assembly line. Um, and it allows me to take away myself and sort of just do, kind of like John Cage was talking about with his rocks. Um, so it kind of, what happens on the press, I don't always control. The press sort of kind of takes over. But then I step away, and I think that's the most important thing for you students to remember. <laughs> Stepping away and then looking at it, and then making conscious choices. Um, if I just draw, it's too easy for me. 
or if I just paint, it's too easy. I get bored. So I need this sort of obsessive activity of printmaking, which is very tedious and time consuming, to sort of occupy some of my energy in a way. Does that answer the question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think another really good question, and I think my work often lends itself to kind of venturing into 3D, but you know, not full-fledged sculpture. Um, and definitely, I could see this piece or work like this actually becoming completely three-dimensional, things hanging from the ceiling and occupying the whole space. And I was thinking about stuff like that um, as I was making it and how that would work. Um, one thing that I want to note about etching is, and I don't know, I probably told you this when you were in um, my class, was that I think of etching as being um, microscopic sculpture. Um, so I really don't see a whole lot of difference between the printmaking and sculpture, or other art forms for that matter. I, I don't see those edges very clearly, but I would like to explore more, for sure. Anyone else? No? Okay. Thank you very much.